All right, uh, welcome to another Stoa Nova conversation. Um, this time with uh, my guest, John Sellers, who I'll introduce in a minute, author of a number of crucial books for the understanding of modern uh, Stoicism. Before we get any further, let me tell you who I am. My name is Massimo Piliucci. I'm a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. And I host these occasional series of chats, which got started as soon as the pandemics um, got started, because I used to do these things in, uh, live at the Society for Ethical Culture in New York. And now we're going to do them uh, internationally, uh, thanks to the modern technology. In fact, before we get started with today's um, uh, topic, uh, let me remind you, in case you haven't checked yet, that the next episode of Stoanova Conversations will take place on Monday, June 1st. So that's next Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And the topic will be the book, The Stoic Challenge by Bill Irvine. And we will have the author uh, to talk about it uh, with us. So that, I'm looking forward to that one. It should be, should be fun. Now, as I said, uh, today, my guest is John Sellers. Welcome, John. Uh, uh, thanks so for uh, inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, John is a lecturer in philosophy at Royal Holloway, University of London, a visiting research fellow at King's College London, and a member of Wilson College, Oxford. He's the author of The Art of Living, The Stoics on the Nature and Function of Philosophy, of Stoicism, of Hellenistic Philosophy. He's one of the founding members of Modern Stoicism, which is the group behind, as you probably all know, Stoic Week and Stoicon. And his latest book, Lessons in Stoicism, was published last year by Penguin. So, John, um, we could be here for hours and hours talking about everything you've written, but you know, I don't want to abuse your patience, so we're going to try to stick within, within the hour. And the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask you a few questions you know, to get our conversation started, mostly on a couple of your books that I reread recently, although feel free to bring in whatever topic you like and whatever reference you like. And we'll go on for a little bit, and then we will open up to a Q&A uh, to see if people actually have, have questions from the audience. And people in the audience, just as a reminder, when you want to ask a question, just raise your virtual hand, not the real one, because I can't see everybody. So your virtual hand, and then I'll call you in the order um, that you raise your hand. Uh, I will turn on your microphone. Don't try to do it yourself, because then you interfere with my <laughs> working, and then we're going to be there a couple of minutes trying to figure out who is pushing what, what buttons. OK, so. John, my questions are mostly about two of your books, Stoicism and The Art of Living. Although, as I said, we can, we can go on, a, on, a, on any other kind of topics. And um, one of the first things you bring up in Stoicism is the question of the sources, uh, the source material. You know, so, so my very first question is, how do we know anything about the Stoics? And what do you think we don't know? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. And one issue that I... Um, have had conversations with with other um, specialists in Stoicism about is what kind of disjoint there might be between what the early Stoa would have looked like and what we think of as the Roman Stoa, right? So we all know what Roman Stoicism looks like. We can read Seneca, we can read Epictetus. We've got a fairly clear idea of, of what's going on there. Um, but for the early Stoa, when we've got all this fragmentary evidence, um, it's really hard to know whether um, something really significant happened um, in the transmission of Stoicism from Athens to Rome. So, and then there's a question of how we piece together all the bits and pieces, right? So, I mean, as you say, there's, there's so much that's lost. How do we know that our attempts at reconstructing um, the evidence for the early Greek Stoa um, goes along the right lines? Um, not long ago, just a few years ago, um, I remember reading something very interestingly by um, Peter Brunt, um, an uh, eminent Roman historian here in Oxford um, who um, wrote various things on Stoicism over the years, not really known as an expert on Stoicism, but they're all brought together uh, in this collected volume. And just in a passing footnote, he says somewhere, I think our image of the early Stoa uh, is completely wrong and misguided because of the <laughs> way in which Hans von Arnim selected certain passages which have become yeah. the canonical set of sources for thinking about what the early Stoa looks like. So it's so for, 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 the, for our listeners, for, so Von Arnim uh, is the major, still today, right? It's the major collection of ancient fragments that we have available. 
Um, that, that's right. And it's like 1903 to 1905. Right. And there was an attempt in, attempt in the Netherlands to try to replace this by producing a more up, up to date collection, but it's never materialized. Um, and he suggests that the early Stoa, particularly Chrysippus, would have contained a lot more of the sort of practical life guidance that we're familiar with from the Roman Stoics than von Arnim lets on because he didn't select the bits of evidence that would present that information to us ah. because he wasn't interested in it, right? So he presents Chrysippus as this kind of arch logician who wasn't interested in anything else. Now, obviously, he was a really important logician. So, I mean, so I just throw that out there to start us off that, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it, we've got this very partial evidence, but we've also got all sorts of very different ways in which we might try and piece it all together. Um, one thing that I've written on briefly in passing that, that, again, I think is often overlooked is the intense admiration for the cynics that the very early Stoics had, right. um, which again resonates with what we see in Epictetus, who obviously clearly really admired someone like um, Diogenes. So again, that might suggest quite a lot of continuity between the two. So in my book, Stoicism that you mentioned, one of the things I tried to do in that book, which I don't think any of the books I'd really read up until that point had tried to do, was to present ancient Stoicism as a single coherent unity. So I talk about Epictetus alongside Zeno and Chrysippus, and I don't right. really separate them all out. Um, most of the things I'd read had really stressed a slightly, I mean, what now feels like a slightly old fashioned narrative where you've got the early Stoics and they're the real deal, right? They're the proper philosophers because they're interested <laughs> in logic and epistemology. Um, and then there are these Romans and they do a bit of moral guidance, but we're not interested in that because that's the decline and fall, right? So, I mean, so if I, if I had an agenda when writing that, that book, Stoicism, it was really to, to present the history of the ancient Stoa as this yeah. continuous tradition. And in fact, you write in, in that book, I'm going to quote a little bit from, from what you uh, write early on in the book. You say, the ethical goal of living in accordance with nature will naturally depend upon at least some understanding of the characteristics of nature, the domain of physics. Similarly, the ethical goal of freedom from emotions will depend upon an understanding of the epistemological concepts of judgment and assent that give rise to emotions, which belong to the domain of logic. Right, so today there is a lot of discussion among modern Stoics about whether we should go Roman, quote unquote, although that might be a misleading way to put it. In other words, just do ethics. Um, or in fact, do what the uh, Stoics, the early Stoics for sure, and as you were arguing, I think also the late, the late ones uh, were doing, that is putting together the physics, the logic, and the ethics, the three parts are, inter, are interconnected. They're not, you, know, you can't just do one without the others. As much as, of course, we might want to revise especially the physics. Uh, you know, the logic is, although we've had advances, advances in logic, of course, over the last, especially century or so, but most of those advances are in fairly technical fields. The, the, the basic logic that the, that the Stoics developed, which is propositional logic, is still per, per, perfectly fine for what we need. Um, of course, we need to, do, uh, to add you know, discoveries from cognitive science and psychology and so on and so forth, which will also all go into our understanding of human reasoning. But it's the physics probably that needs the most understanding. But so would you say, what, what's your take, I guess, about, about these discussions going on uh, these days about, you know, we should just do ethics or now we should really try to recover all three? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, I'm going to give two potentially contradictory responses to that. Right. Sure. <laughs> so, um, but I hope that, I mean, but, but I mean, I th they can fit together, right? So one of them would be to say, that um, the Stoics do offer completely um, autonomous arguments for their ethical views. So we get a very specific set of arguments for um, uh, why we ought to uh, prioritize virtue, why we ought not to value indifference. And we've got those arguments and those arguments stand or fall um, independent of anything we might see in the, the physics. So there's a sense in which if someone wanted to say, I'm just going to be interested in the ethics, and I'm not going to look at all this other stuff, the logic and the physics, then the Stoics give a foundation for their ethics that looks like it can stand on, on, it, on its own. Um, having said that, um, I'm completely convinced of the idea that the Stoics saw their philosophy as this integrated system and they saw um, everything fit together. And I'd certainly want to challenge the idea that the Roman Stoics were just doing ethics. Um, I think that's just false. And in fact, I mean, shameless plug, I've recently finished writing a book on Marcus Aurelius. Um, oh, nice. will we'll come out at the beginning of July, 
And um, what I want to do in that book, or what I've tried to do in that book, is to show the way in which Marcus is equally interested in logic, physics, and ethics, which mm. is not the sort of thing that most people would assume. So I'll, I'll throw, give you just a couple of examples of what I mean by this. The first is, Marcus constantly talks about impressions, about testing his impressions um, all, the way, all the way through. That's the big task, right? You've got to test your impressions, make sure you only um, um, assent to the, the correct impressions. Um, it's a really dominant theme. And the study of impressions and the analysis of impressions and using our judgments is, as you know, part of logic as the Stoics conceive it, right? Their conception of logic is much broader than just formal logic and, and syllogisms. Right. It's, it contains everything we'd now think of uh, as epistemology. So Marcus is really interested in what on Stoic terms would count as a logical theme. And it's, it's center stage in the meditations. Um, and then if you think about what else goes on in the meditations, he's talking a lot about nature. Um, now, because I'm this kind of nerdy academic, I've got this fantastic book, which is a complete um, uh, uh, lexicon to the meditations that tells you all the word frequencies for every single Greek word in the text, right? Oh, nice. It's fantastic book, right? So <laughs> I can tell you definitively, without having to have, had to count myself, if you take out all of the little words, the ands, the ors, and the buts, if you strip out all of those, the most common word in the meditations with any substantial content is phusis. Uh -huh. Nature is the word that right. comes up most often in the meditations. Um, virtue, I mean, in fact, virtue is not that common. A goodness or, or the good um, is, is um, half as frequent as nature in the meditations, mm -hmm. right? Nice. And, and what's he talking about in the meditations? He's talking about change. He's talking about um, uh, the expanse of time. He's talking about death, um, which he understands as a physical process of change. Um, it's actually physical themes that predominate in the meditations. There's not that much ethics in it at all. I'm going to controversially argue in this, in this book. So, nice. so I think Mar Marcus is a logic, physics and ethics philosopher for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, I mean, for, first of all, that's interesting. I'm looking forward to, to that book coming out and maybe later in the summer or in the early fall, we can, we can have another conversation about that specifically. But, you know, of course, Marcus is not the only one of the of the uh, Roman Stoics, right? Uh, in that respect, I mean, we, people tend to forget, for instance, that Seneca wrote Naturalis Questionis. That's a that's a work of physics, and so there, we do have, and we have at least list of titles of other things written by, uh, you know, some of the some of the so-called Roman, the minor Roman Stoics, the, meaning the ones that we don't actually know much about, because nothing survived, unfortunately. Uh, um, so now I wanted to, to um, steal from Stoicism, from your sto book Stoicism, to give um, uh, listeners a little bit of a taste of what it actually is like to talk about not just the ethics. Like, for instance, there's this nice quote that I have in, in your book that says, Stoic ontology posits a supreme genus of something under which there are two subdivisions of existing bodies or corporeals and subsisting, subsisting ones in corporeals. For the Stoics, then existence or being is not the highest ontological genus. When I read that, I, 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 first of all, it made a lot of sense to me. And in fact, uh, that kind of distinction should probably be recovered in modern metaphysics because modern metaphysics is a mess in terms of <laughs> the difference between you know, uh, physical objects and abstract objects, etc. Would you mind expanding for a second? You know, what does that mean? And then why, why, why did they think that way? Okay, so... Um... The, the, the highest category that they place above being the category of, of T or something is part of a polemical move against Platonism, uh, I think. So I'm only in favor of polemical moves against Platonism, so go ahead. <laughs> so, so the highest category is to be something by which they mean to be a particular, right? So the claim is really that it's particular things that exist. Um, there are no universals um, in the platonic sense. Um, everything is something specific, right? Um, and then that breaks down into these two categories. So then you have uh, specific incorporeal things um, and you have specific um, physically extended uh, uh, bodily things. Um, so I think, so that's part of what's going on, I think. Obviously, again, this is an example of what we were mentioning earlier, something that's that people have done their best to reconstruct out of some horribly fragmentary evidence. Right. Um, 
And as is often the way, the sources are deeply polemical against the, the Stoics. So th they've got these two categories. And as you say, in some ways, there's something um, very um, useful about having these two different um, metaphysical uh, uh, categories. Um, the ancient critics aren't so generous. So <laughs> their view would be something like this, that the Stoics try to be materialists. They try to say that everything's a body, but then ag against the force of objections, they realize that that just doesn't quite work. And there are some <laughs> things they're just gonna have to admit exist, like void, for instance, or time. There's nothing they can do to, to, to claim that those things are bodies, but they can't say they, they're, they're not real at all. So they have to concoct this other strange category of, right. of incorporeals in order right. to, to fit that within their system. And, and as I said, this, this is actually clearly reminiscent of discussions in modern metaphysics. I mean, I tend to be, even outside of stoicism, I tend to be a materialist or physicalist or whatever, whatever you want to put it. I do think that everything that exists is in fact made of matter or and that's a big qualification, is has to be grounded in matter. So if you say, well, the concept of a university is not made of stuff, I would obviously agree. It's an abstract concept, right? But that thing will not exist. That concept will not exist unless there are material minds, and material brains that are capable of thinking of that sort of stuff. And so to me, that kind of, this kind of distinction that the Stoics made actually is like, where's meant? Like, yeah, that's pretty much what I think. I wouldn't <laughs> use those terms, of course, but, um, yeah. but that's, that's pretty much it. So one more thing from Stoics is before we move to the art of living, where, where I think we're gonna spend quite a bit of time. Um, and that is one of the many interesting concepts you bring up is uh, in the chapter on ethics is one of okayosis. And I noticed that even people who, who uh, uh, practice stoicism or, or read about stoicism tend to be confused about what okayosis actually is. Would, would you mind sort of give us your, your take on it? Yeah, sure. So when I first became interested in stoicism, this was one part of the, the whole um, uh, uh, the, the whole philosophy that I thought was really attractive. So I think this is really, uh, really good. And the two um, main summaries that we've got of, of Stoic ethics from antiquity both start with this theory. So it looks as if it was thought to be foundational. And it's basically the thought that the foundation for ethics is in um, um, self-interest. Um, and I just find that eminently believable, right? That yeah. we are fundamentally by interest you know, so we are, we are fundamentally self-interested, right? Our first instincts are for ourselves, our self-preservation, for um, getting what we need in order to survive and not getting killed. And the idea that that's a kind of a naturalistic account of the kind of basics of human nature, I think just seems plausible rather than a kind of high-minded ethical idea that, you know, we're all naturally altru altruistic and other regarding and we don't have this, these kind of uh, instincts. I, I never, never bought that, right? I was always a kind of sort of, you know, I read a lot of Nietzsche when I was a teenager, right? I was always skeptical of that kind of <laughs> morality, right? Yeah. So start with self-interest, I can believe that. Um, and so that's really the theory that by nature, human beings pursue their own survival and they'll attribute value to things on the basis of whether they think it's going to contribute to their survival or whether it's going to harm them. And so our basic ideas of what good and bad are are um, decided uh, um, in the light of this, in, this, this instinct to self-preservation. So that's how we first start to separate things out as good and bad, right? So being healthy is good, being ill is bad. Really simple, really straightforward. And that applies to animals of which humans are just one type. And then they say, well, humans obviously, you know, I mean, this is ancient Greece. Humans aren't just straightforwardly animals. Um, they're rational animals. Um, and as we develop, as we become fully rational agents, um, um, uh, once we become adults, then our sense of self starts to shift, right? So our sense of who we are starts to develop. We no longer see ourselves as simply this, uh, animal, the, these animals driven with those basic drives. We see ourselves as rational agents and we start to value um, our survival as rational agents. And so suddenly we start to value different types of things as we develop. So we start to value consistency. We start to value rationality. We start to value um, the sorts of virtues that we know will, will help us become good social animals, right? So on a process of, through a process of, of, of gaining self-knowledge and self-understanding and realizing that we are rational social animals, 
we come to value the things that enable us to be good rational social animals. And that's good in a kind of you know, non-moral sense. Um, so the, 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 the ethics has this really naturalistic foundation. And I, I think that's just makes it really robust. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that's right. I mean, uh, frankly, I've been through a number of phases in my life about, about uh, meta-ethics, because what we're talking about here is meta-ethics, what, what philosophers refer to as meta-ethics, you know, what grounds ethics. And uh, yeah, I was never convinced by the, essentially the two opposite views, the two extreme views. One is this high-minded thing is like, no, ethics is just, just all, you know, we're all naturally, uh, you know, altruistic, or we arrive at by reason of being altruistic and only by reason, that's the Kantian approach. Um, I never bought that. At the same time, I never bought these, you know, essentially social Darwinist idea that we're all in this to, you know, kill each other as much as possible, take advantage of each other as much as possible because it's all about number one. And so my, the first version of naturalistic ethics that I encountered that actually sounded plausible to me was David Hume's. And, and Hume was actually fairly uh, well versed in ancient philosophy. He wrote an essay on the cynics and one on the skeptics and one on the stoics. And he's, he was, although he certainly didn't, re didn't consider himself a stoic practitioner or anything like that, he was actually fairly sympathetic to, the, to stoic philosophy. In general, but the Stoic approach um, uh, to ethical to naturalistic naturalistic ethics seems to me uh, very valuable in terms of even you know, modern science, because modern science tells us that you know comparative anthropology and comparative climatology tell us that yes, indeed, we are in fact social and fundamentally social animals. Uh, we are related to other social animals like the bonobos, and being a social animal means exactly what you just said: having instincts that are for self-preservation. Yes, but also for cooperation within the group, because otherwise you're less likely to survive as, a, as an individual if the group doesn't, doesn't thrive. Where I think we share those, and it's pretty good evidence that we share those instincts with other social primates. Uh, what makes us distinct from other animal species, is what you were saying is like at some point we also develop a capacity to reason. And uh, even though it's true that human beings, let's say naturally, uh, you know, intuitively cooperate with members of the in-group, it's also equally true that we tend to be naturally xenophobic. We don't trust members from other groups. Uh, and that's probably because our evolutionary history uh, was such that, you know, if somebody looked different than was coming from outside, it was probably bad news. Um, but today, reason allows us to say, yeah, but I don't have to act on that one. I, have, I, I can actually expand by, by way of my reasoning, my circles of, of concern, which is essentially what, um, Hierocles, I guess, writes in the, uh, in the Principles of Ethics where he has this famous uh, image of the concentric circles that you want to get closer and closer to, uh, to yourself, right? That's right. So the self-interest is the starting point, but it's not the destination. Right. That's the key point to, <laughs> to stress yeah. as well. And again, to pick up on what I was saying earlier, um, I mean, I'm inclined also to see this as an anti-Platonic move, right? Where there's um, the suggestion that there's some kind of completely objective um, uh, um, notion of goodness that is beyond, you know, something almost, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get lost in platonic metaphysics right now, right? But something right. almost <laughs> otherworldly, you know, it, who knows what it is or where it, what its foundation is. Whereas the Stoic account gives us a very straightforward down to earth foundation. This is why you think some things are good and why you think some things are bad. Exactly. I, I want to move on to the art of living. And you, before we even get to the book itself, I was interesting, it was interesting to me how the publisher introduces your book. Because there's a okay. phrase that I'm, that I'm reading, and I'm going to read to you, which, and I'd like to, to have your comment on it, uh, because it struck me as interesting. Um, the publisher says, Sellers argues that the conception of philosophy as an art of living, inaugurated by Socrates and developed by the Stoics, has persisted since antiquity and remains, and this is the interesting part to me, a living alternative to modern attempts to assimilate philosophy to the natural sciences. Now, this strikes a chord with me because, um, it, you know, for most of my career, I was in fact a natural scientist. I was a biologist who had an interest, strong interest in philosophy. And then at some point, I shift field, fields and I you know, went back and got my PhD in philosophy. And then eventually, I completely switched fields. And my naive um, sort of hope initially. Uh, turned out to be naive was that once I made the transition, you know, my new colleagues in philosophy would actually, you know, pay attention to what I was saying about my specific field, philosophy of science, because I had the credentials of being a scientist. Uh, 
Uh, and at the same time, my older colleagues, you know, the, the, the scientists would actually pay attention because, you know, it's like, well, yeah, he's a philosopher, but he's, you know, he comes from, he knows the science. He's actually done the science for like 25 years. Turns out, of course, exactly the opposite, meaning that typically my philosopher uh, colleagues, although friendly, they tend to be skeptical of somebody who has been a scientist and vice versa. My science colleagues tend to be skeptical of somebody who moved to the philosophy. And um, so that, that phrase, you know, living alternative to, to modern attempts to assimilate philosophy to natural sciences is struck me as particularly interesting. What, what do you think is going on there? What's, what is this, this attempt to assimilate philosophy to natural sciences? And is really a philosophy, reconceiving philosophy as the ancient did as an art of living one way at least to stem that, that, uh, that attempt. Yeah, so I mean, as you were reading that blurb out, as you started, sure. I thought, that sounds like some copy that I've sent them. And then by the time <laughs> you got to the end, I definitely didn't write that. So, <laughs> so I probably wrote says, the first half of that sentence. I don't right. know where the last bit came. Um, I mean, I guess, I, I guess that reference to philosophy assimilated to natural sciences is probably their attempt to refer to analytic philosophy, right? I yes. don't think it's really making some grand claim about um, uh, uh, um, about science beyond that at all. Okay. So, um, well, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes yeah. Sense. So I, I imagine that's probably what what they had in mind. Um, but it is one of those things that it, it's interesting to me. Once you know, as I said, in philosophy, my technical field is philosophy of science, certainly not stoicism, not, and definitely not ancient philosophy. But once I started writing about stoicism for a you know broader public and, and giving lectures about stoicism, I have noticed a significant amount of skepticism from my even my philosophy colleagues, because like, so wait a minute, what are you doing here? Uh, why is that important? Why is that really? That's not true philosophy. And, and it struck me as very interesting because actually an argument can be made that that is true philosophy. In fact, it might be in a sense truer, at least as true as the kind of philosophy that actually gets done in, uh, in academic departments these days, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you take the long historical view, you think about all of the different ways in which philosophy has been conceived over the last two and a half thousand years. For a significant portion of that time, people have automatically assumed that philosophy is something like a guide to how to live. Um, the idea that philosophy is a very you know, narrow academic subject is the product of the specialization that starts to kick in towards the end of the 18th century and really takes off in the 19th century. Yet even in the 19th century, you've got people like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche who would fit much more closely to this way of thinking about what philosophy is. And if you think about 20th century existentialists as well, for instance, again, people working outside of a university setting. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to present, so, so I think the idea of philosophy as a way of life or as a guide to how to live has been a perennial one and we see it continue all the way through. Um, equally, um, I think that what we might call the more academic way of thinking about philosophy, if I put it that way very crudely, also has a much longer prehistory. So a lot of the philosophy that goes on in the late Middle Ages, for instance, I mean, there was a moment in the 1980s where analytic trained, analytically trained philosophers became really interested in late medieval philosophy because they mm. realized that, that there was lots and lots of logic and philosophy of language going on right. there and lots of paradoxes and all of that kind of stuff. So they became really interested in it because they could see that these guys in the, in the 1400s were doing the same sort of thing that, that they were doing now. Um, and if you go all the way back to, to, to Aristotle, say, I mean, you know, I mean, on the one hand, you know, Aristotle obviously is you know, very seriously engaged in ethics. But in terms of what he sets out in a book like the Metaphysics, for instance, um, he's doing something that much, is much closer to, 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 to analytic philosophy in many, many ways. Um, and again, you see a flourish of analytically trained philosophers in the 60s and 70s in particular, all starting to do lots of work on Aristotle because they see him as a kindred spirit. Um, so I think, I mean, the one thing that I mentioned in, in, at the beginning of The Art of Living, and I've mentioned a couple of other places since, is the idea of, of what I've called metaphilosophical pluralism. So it's not as if everyone in antiquity thought philosophy was one thing, everyone in the Middle Ages thought it was one thing, and everyone now thinks it's one thing. I think there have been these debates and arguments about what philosophy is and what its purpose is all the way through because it's one of these horrible slippery terms that can yeah. be put to work in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. 
And if you're an Aristotelian, you can see it as something quite closely aligned to the sciences, for instance. Yeah, and my, my take in general on this is that there is no contradiction between those two different modes. I mean, as, mm. as you pointed out, you know, both of them have been going on for literally thousands of years, and not just in the East, in Western tradition, in, including the Eastern traditions, right? And the, the Buddhist philosophy has also uh, produced a lot of logic, and it's produced, you know, Indian philosophy has produced a lot of logic, um, and and natural what we call natural philosophy. So there really is no contradiction between the two of them, and. Maybe we should use two different terms if we're talking about the art of living versus, you know, academic philosophy, or maybe not. Who cares? You know, after all, the terminology is is, is, what, is what it is. Um, it really seems strange, however, for, for me to sort of see how one group wants to say, no, this is really philosophy, and the other stuff is like, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Explain. Right, and so, I mean, if, you, if you've got a group of, of say, very, very um, analytic philosophers teaching a, an undergraduate philosophy degree, and they teach their first year students formal logic and critical reasoning and right. um, all of these sorts of skills. Um, do they really think that those skills are irrelevant to how they conduct the rest of their lives? I hope not. I hope they think <laughs> that those critical reasoning skills are going to fundamentally transform their students' lives for the better in all sorts of ways, right? Yeah, so agree. they're surely committed to that, that claim at some level. Now, that said, in, in chapter four of uh, The Art of Living, you actually talk about one of the ancient uh, uh, philosophers who was, in fact, skeptical of the, the whole notion of, of uh, uh, The Art of Living, and that was Sextus Empiricus, the, the, the skeptic. So he has a number of arguments. In fact, you go through, I think, four different arguments that he, that he had, uh, one of which is The Art of Living cannot be taught, which would come to a surprise to a bunch of other people, right? So, so, so what's your take on the, on the skeptics challenge on the art of living? Yeah, so, so, so Sextus Empiricus is a, is a, is a Pyrrhonist. So he, he, he attacks the idea of, the, uh, of an art of living, but then he attacks the idea of everything, right? So he doesn't think there's <laughs> any right. knowledge about anything. So he's not particularly signaling out the, uh, the problem of the art of living. I mean, it's the uh -huh. fact that it contains knowledge claims that he finds so problematic. So it's, it's the fact that they think it's a techne, it's the fact that they think that you can really know something and then put that to work. And he doesn't think they can know anything because he doesn't think anyone can know anything. Right. So, um, so, um, so that's really where he's, where, where he's coming from. Um, so if you have doubts about that general uh, Peronian skeptical project, then you can kind of rescue his idea of the art of living. I mean, I'll just as, as an aside, I'll say a little, perhaps say a little bit about um, why I included uh, that discussion, which also is connected to the genesis of the whole book, actually, in the whole project, and uh, um, which is this. So when I was a graduate student and I was first starting to get, get seriously interested in this material, um, I, and I read Pierre Hadot's book uh, when it first came out in English in 1995, and various other things, Martha Nussbaum's book came out around that time, um, um, I was seeing all these phrases banded about, right? Philosophy is a way of life. Philosophy is a therapy. Philosophy is an art of living. Um, philosophy is a technology of the self, right? Uh, uh, in, in the Hellenistic period, all these phrases were being thrown about. And I was just, what do any of these actually mean? <laughs> what do they mean? Can we actually pin any of them down? And did anyone in antiquity actually use any of these phrases, right? Um, so I started doing a trawl, and, um, and the art of living was one phrase that I found was actually used in antiquity, right? No, people didn't use any of the, the other sort of phrases that people were throwing about, but the art of living was one that actually had ancient precedent. So that's why I decided to focus on that. Um, and it turned out that all of the sources were connected to the Stoics. Um, so that's why it was on the Stoics. And then right. Sextus Empiricus is the, the source that uses that phrase more than anyone else. So that polemic by Sextus Empiricus is the largest ancient textual source for the idea that there might be such thing as an art of living. So given that, yeah. I kind of had to discuss it, right? Yeah, um, of course. Now, the, in, the, in the following chapter, in chapter five, you talk about um, practice and in fact, the relationship between theory and practice, which is another one of those uh, recurring themes in modern discussions of stoicism. There, there's a quote from Epictetus that you put in there from the first volume of the discourses. The quote goes like this, the philosophers first exercise us in theory where there is less difficulty, and then after that lead us to the more difficult matters. For in theory, there is nothing which holds us back from following what we have taught, but in the affairs of life, 
there are so many things which draw us away. And then he continues to discuss. So, so in your mind, for, for people who are actually interested in not just the theory of stoicism, not just the sort of the ancient history, but the practice, what is a good way to think about the relationship between theory and practice? Okay, good. So, yeah, I mean, again, that's what one of the one of the central themes of the of the book as um, a whole. So, and again, this was this was really an attempt to kind of negotiate some of these difficult phrases. So, so um, Pierre had always talked about ancient philosophy being a spiritual exercise. It was just an exercise, and some right. people criticised him for this and said, "Well, if you just think it's a series of practical exercises, you've lost the philosophy." Philosophy is about arguments, it's about truth. If you haven't got that, then how does this differ from a religious way of life? Um, and I think that that's a fair point, right? Whether it's a fair criticism of Hado is a separate thing, I'll bracket that, but I think it's a, 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 a fair point. Um, this is philosophy and Chrysippus is presenting arguments. He is a logician, right? <laughs> I mean, he's many right. other things too, but he's a serious logician. Um, and we've got plenty of those uh, Stoic arguments that survive. So that's clearly fundamental to what Stoicism is all about. It's not simply a series of practices. It's a series of practices grounded on a series of truth claims, and all of those truth claims are argued for. And um, as the passage you just read out um, uh, from Epictetus makes clear, um, he certainly conceived it in, in that way too. So you've got to do the theory, but in order for, for that to have any real value, or any real purchase, you've then got to do the practice. Why do you have to do the practice? Because we're riddled with bad habits. Um, and in fact, there's a nice passage in Musonius Rufus that I don't think I'd come across when I wrote that book, which was almost 20 years ago now, but certainly read more recently, where Musonius basically says, the theory is, the, the practice is so much harder than the theory because we're brought up with a whole series of bad habits from our environment. So we're at this huge disadvantage before we even begin. Um, and so that's why the second part is so much, is, is so much more challenging. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in fact, when, I would, when, when you were talking, I was thinking exactly about that particular quote by Musonio Rufus that I reread recently. And, and it's interesting because he lays out very clearly the notion that you do need the, the theory because otherwise you're, gonna, you're practicing blind. If you don't have a theory behind, if you don't have a framework of some sort, then what exactly are you practicing? But the theory by itself obviously isn't going to do it precisely for the reason that you just uh, pointed out. Now you mentioned the word spiritual there, spiritual exercises. That's also a controversial, controversial word in, in modern circles because people, at least some people who are you know, non-religious for instance, but attracted to stoicism, they think that you know, anything that, that's spiritual like smells of funny stuff. And so maybe we shouldn't use the word uh, and to be frank, I was one of those people years ago before I even approached Stoicism. Um, but now I can't really find a better term. Uh, and I simply tend to use the word spiritual in a, in a broader sense, in a sense of good for your mind, good for your you know, psychological well, well-being. But all of, any, any other individual, any other descriptor that, you, that I can come up with at least tends to be a phrase, sentence, not, not a single word. And so there's not much word problematic and spiritual do you think um yeah i mean it's 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 just a word as you say um so musonius uses the phrase um a scarcest test uh, exercise of the soul so if you take spiritual exercise as a translation of exercise of the soul um i mean uh, so uh, you know well known as as you'll know well known at ancient philosophy scholar john cooper got himself very exercised about this in his book pursuits of wisdom um, right. I mean, if you want a different phrase, call it mental training, right? Sure. I yeah. mean, mental training, I mean, basically means the same thing as spiritual exercise for yeah. people that are freaked out by the word spiritual. <laughs> um, but hey, I mean, one thing, something I've learned from modern stoicism and stoic week and all of this is um, we're speaking to an incredibly broad church of people from a very wide range of backgrounds and for some of those people spiritual is exactly what they're looking for and that that word actually will attract them and bring them in um, yeah. even if it runs the risk of, of perhaps putting some other people off so if we can use a variety of different phrases that will kind of connect with different groups of people then i think all the better yeah, I agree. Okay, we, I want to open the Q&A in, in a couple of minutes, but there are actually a couple of major things that I wanted to bring up. One of which is, right at the conclusion of your book, 
I found that the conclusion is one of the most interesting parts. I enjoyed every bit of the book, but uh, one of the, the conclusions is one of the most interesting parts because there you lay out this notion that the ancients had a sort of an informal three-pronged curriculum uh, about how to study philosophy, practical philosophy, and how to study the art of living. And you say that that was basically, that curriculum was based on three types of literature. Literature concerning, uh, concerned with action, literature concerned with arguments and doctrines, and literature concerned with practical exercises. So you want to expand a little bit about uh, on that? Yeah, sure. So that was me really piecing together various things that I'd found during the course of writing the book. So in the very first chapter, I talk about the way in which a number of different philosophers in different schools in antiquity were particularly interested in uh, biographies of philosophers. So, right. um, so some people will be familiar with Diogenes Laertius, it's history of philosophy written as a series of lives or biographies of philosophers. Um, and amongst the late Neoplatonists, uh, very different from the Stoics in some ways, but they always said the first thing you do when you want to study a philosopher is study the biography of the philosopher mm -hmm. to see how they lived, to have an image of their way of life. And I just thought that was really striking. Um, some, uh, for a philosopher like Plotinus, for instance, when Porphyry organizes all of his texts, he writes a biography of Plotinus, and that comes at the beginning. Um, and Seneca makes reference to this too. So the idea that the first thing you do is you read a, a biography of a philosopher and that sets up this admirable image, right? And so, and in fact, that's the very that's how Stoicism started, right? It's, isn't the, according to the Eugenius Laertius, at least, uh, Zeno of Sidium, the founder of Stoicism, uh, got into the philosophy by reading Xenophon's Memorabilia, which is essentially a biography of uh, of Socrates. So it really got started that way, right? That's, yeah, that's... absolutely, absolutely. And and the Apology of Socrates is a uh, is a kind of a key point of reference for people these days as well. Um, and so that creates you the, the, that gives you the, the image of someone living a life according to wisdom or virtue or however you want to put it. So that's the first type of literature, right? That's the first thing you give your students. It's like, that's the sort of person I want to be. That's the role model that I want to aspire to. Then you study the arguments and you, you do the theory and then you read them also on a practical text like say Epictetus handbook or, or whatever it might be that will help you then digest those ideas and transform your habits so you can then really start to digest the philosophical theory that you studied and start to become that kind of virtuous uh, individual. So if you were a modern stoic that wanted to follow something like that, like for instance, I mean, let me propose this as a, as a possibility. So let's say I teach a course, which I do actually in, in ancient practical philosophy here at City College. And every time I do it, I do it dif differently. But let's say I wanted to one semester try uh, sort of this notion of the three-pronged curriculum. Could I do something like uh, have my students read Xenophon's Memorabilia, for instance, for the, for the first group? And then uh, Seneca's On Anger, maybe, for the, for the second group. And then uh, Epictetus and Caridian as the third group, or something like that. Yeah, absolutely, that could work. Um, I mean, thinking about my own personal favorites, I'd probably, I'd probably go for the Apology for, mm -hmm. the, for the first group, um, simply because it's a text I particularly like and I, and I, and I, and I enjoy teaching it already. Um, as I've been reading lots over the last year or so, maybe I'd go for Marcus Aurelius for the third. Um, it's you know different type of different type of text, but it's a text devoted to that kind of practical exercise and right. digestion. Um, but yeah, on, I mean, on anger is a is 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 a great choice. But then for the middle, there's a kind of um, I was going to say there's huge variety, but actually for the Stoics, we don't Not have such much, a wide variety <laughs> because right. uh, there aren't so many that survive that give us all those juicy arguments. But yeah, yeah on I mean, anger, I wish we had Chrysippus or something like that, but, but we yeah. don't. Well, there, there might right, be some. There yeah. might be some in Naples sitting in shoeboxes. That's right. <laughs> we, can, we can only hope. Um, okay, let, let's open up for Q&A for the last few minutes. Uh, Ron, you are the first one. I'm going to unmute you and go ahead. Hi, guys. This is a question. Uh, I'd be happy if both of you take a crack at it. It's a big question, so I'm, I'm going to put it in the context of a, a, a larger question so that it'll help you to narrow the question down. Um, in ancient Greek, uh, the, the Delphic Oracle is said, um, know thyself. So my question is uh, for the Stoics, and I get, you know, there obviously there are a number of different ones. Um, what is their ultimate um, 
idea of the self, myself. In other words, who am I uh, so that everything else that will then, you know, grow out of my understanding of myself? Yeah, good question. Particularly yeah, in the you. context of, of it being a practical philosophy. Right. Thank you. All right, John, what do you think? Yeah, sure. So thank you for that. Um, I mean, I think there are perhaps two aspects to that. One, which we've touched on already. So the idea, know yourself as a human being, know that you're a rational social animal. There's, a, there's, there's that kind of element of self-knowledge, which isn't unique to you, but it's, it's fundamental to understanding who you are and what type of thing you are in the world. So there's that kind of, of, of self-knowledge, I think. Um, but there's also a more specific, unique self-knowledge that I think the Stoics were very interested in. And we see this in Cicero's book on duties, where he's reporting the ideas of an earlier Stoic called Panaetius. Um, and uh, there, Cicero talks about the way in which um, one of the things that we need to pay attention to when thinking about how best to live is um, our own unique, peculiar characteristics, right? So there's three different ways in which someone might try to live according to nature. There's living according to nature with a capital N, right? The external world and, and what happens. There's living according to human nature that I just touched on, um, the fact we're, we're rational social animals. But there's also living according to our own unique nature, right? Some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts, some of us are artistic and creative, some of us are natural sports people, or whatever it might be. And if someone's trying to pursue a line of activity that is out of sync with who they really are in that very personal sense, then their life's not going to go well, not going to go smoothly, right? They're, they'll be living a lie, right? They'll, yeah, and they'll suffer right. that kind of disruption. So right. there's that kind of self-knowledge that, that Cicero stresses is really important for us to kind of decide who we are, what kind of activities are right and appropriate for us if we want the smooth flow of life that, nice. that Zeno recommended. Uh, Fabrizio, you're next. Yep. Hey, uh, I would like to focus on the two ways described uh, by Sellers at the beginning, especially on the first one, the ethics only, let's say the Roman way. And uh, my question is, so since in the sources we see that they talk about nature, they talk about uh, logic uh, and other things that though are touched uh, only uh, in some of the sources, uh, let's say, in, in deeply. From the, from the point of view of the practitioner, isn't it almost an act of faith to, uh, to embrace the, the, the stoic ethics, uh, so uh, like directly from the sources, since they are so, since everything they are appear to be based on is so fragmentary and, uh, and uh, also we don't have a deep understanding of the underlying discourse compared to more modern ethics. And on the other side, if we were to reform based on modern knowledge of science, of, uh, uh, of yeah, physics and logic, let's say, uh, why would we even keep the name uh, uh, stoicism because we would be like basing it on a whole different body of knowledge let's say yeah, thank you john what do you think yes yeah, so um so yeah so two thoughts on that so the first thought is don't take anything on faith right <laughs> just don't do that right it's philosophy um there are arguments um and uh, I mean, some of them do survive. Uh, others have been reconstructed by, by scholars that have worked on, on particular topics, but there are arguments there and you either find them convincing or, or you don't, but, but you can find them. So, so um, I would, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't encourage anyone to kind of just accept the kind of basic claims on faith and then say, I'm gonna become a practitioner. I mean, you, you can do that if you want, but, but that's not really the spirit of Stoicism. Um, I mean, you know, Seneca famously says that the Stoics were all constantly um, arguing amongst one another, unlike the Epicureans, who all are in love with Epicurus and hang on his every word. So that's mm -hmm. not in the spirit of Stoicism. So that's the first thing I'd say. And, and then picking up on that point with regard to, to, to uh, the updating of the physics, I mean, I always think this is a kind of interesting discussion, and I've heard Massimo talk about this or write about this on a number of occasions. 
about the need to update stoic physics. And this is the one point, a very minor point, but it's the one point where I kind of respectfully disagree with Massimo just a little bit, which, uh, but in a positive way, I hope, which is, I don't think we need to worry so much about updating stoic physics, because that assumes that there's this single monolithic thing called ancient stoic physics. And I'm not convinced there is. So for instance, Chrysippus famously says that the seat of the soul is in the heart. But we have another passage where a different Stoic says, no, 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 it's in the, it's in the head. It's definitely in the brain, right? right. Um, you know, that you could say is updating, would be updating Stoic physics in the light of more recent evidence. But they were already arguing about this then. Um, and some of the other middle Stoics, one of them denies that there's a, an eternal recurrence uh, um, um, uh, uh, of the world, a cyclical recurrence. Um, so they were already arguing about that. That, um, uh, that another one argues that he doesn't think that the natural world is itself um, a, a, a conscious, uh, uh, is conscious and intelligent. Um, it's just a biological process. So many of the things in ancient Stoic physics that we might think these things have got to be updated. It's, there wasn't a universal consensus even in antiquity. So even there, we can see people pushing back against these things. And so, I mean, that's one of the things in um, um, uh, Lawrence Becker's book that I know Massimo is a big, a big fan of about, you know, what would Stoicism look like if it had continued and had gone through all of these processes? And on the basis of these few arguments that we see in the late Hellenistic period, I mean, I've no doubt whatsoever they would have just updated and adapted as they went along because they were empiricists and, and they were naturalists. And we do see the fragments of that already there in the ancient discussion. So I don't think we would end up with something that was unstoic. We'd be very much within the spirit of stoicism still, I think. All right, next we got Greg, my friend and co-author Greg Lopez. Greg, go ahead. Hi, John, good to see you. Um, I echo Massimo's appreciation of the conclusion. Uh, it serves as a very great summary of the entire book that could almost be read on its own. It also emphasizes some important points. And one of those points um, you mentioned is the personal nature of the philosophy. You state a further characteristic worth underlining is the personal nature of philosophy conceived in this way. For Socrates, the task of taking care of oneself is fundamentally a private project. So a lot of beginner and probably even intermediate people in Stoicism kind of go on Stoic forums and stuff and say, what would a Stoic do? And to me, this seems like a very abstract question because it abstracts away too much of the individual circumstances and the individual person themselves. So that's essentially non-answerable. Um, my question is, first of all, do you agree with this? And secondly, do you think this general question of what a Stoic would do is in part inspired by modern moral philosophy, which tends to take rules that are about what people should do, period, whereas the ancient view of ethics was not quite like that. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, yeah, good to see you, Greg. Um, that's a horribly complicated question, really interesting, <laughs> lots of bits to it. Um, let me see if I can unpack some of it. Some of it. So, um, Again, I mean, to, to mention Socrates again, I mean, one thing we see in the Apology is he, he, he says, each person has to take care of the, themselves, themselves. Um, he can't do it for them. All he can do is provoke them to do it for themselves. And I think that that's one kind of key idea that, you know, um, you know the person that goes to the, the therapist expecting the therapist to solve their problems for them, uh, you know, hasn't quite understood how the process works, perhaps, right? The, the therapist is there to nudge them so that they can start to realize how they can fix it themselves, right? I'm not a therapist, I've never been to therapy, but that's my kind of, you know, sense of how these things, should, you know, have to work, right? You can't just fix someone, but you can kind of be that guy that can help them fix themselves. So there's that element to it. Um, there's an intense scholarly discussion um, in Stoic ethics about uh, rule following and the extent to which the Stoics proposed rules or the extent to which they suggested that there aren't any general moral rules and everyone has to work out what the appropriate way to behave is in the specific unique situation that they find themselves in. And this connects to the idea, I think, that we think of Stoicism as a form of virtue ethics. So it's not so much about following a set of rules, it's about developing a certain set of character traits that will then serve you well, no matter what sort of circumstances you find yourself in, right? So if you can cultivate courage or justice or generosity or whatever it might be, then you don't need a rule. You just need to 
have those character traits um, um, express themselves or, or be expressed in whatever decision making that you're that you're making. I think we have time for at least one more question. That's Daniel. Um, Daniel, go ahead. Hi. Um, so my question is about the importance and relevance of studying logic, because you made a big point about how it was important to the um, ancients to study logic. So should modern Stoics also be studying logic? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to say emphatically yes. And I'm going to give a shout out to Greg, who we just heard from as well, because Greg gave a short talk about this at Stoicon in Athens, in which he said, modern Stoics should be doing their logic exercises. And I think that's a really good, important point. I mean, so the, 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 you know, the, the aim of Stoicism is to live consistently with nature. Um, the earliest formulation we have of that is just um, to live consistently, right? <laughs> to right. have a consistent set of beliefs that don't contradict the, uh, um, themselves. I mean, how can you have a, a smooth inner psychological life if your mind is full of a whole series of contradictory different beliefs that don't fit together into a coherent wor worldview and that pull you in opposing directions, right? That's not a recipe for a good, a good psychological state of mind. And so if the study of logic can help you weed out the conflicting beliefs or at least realize that some of your beliefs don't necessarily fit together into a coherent whole, then I actually think that's a really valuable exercise. So I'm going to say a big yes for modern Stoics paying attention to critical reasoning and studying logic. Yeah, I, I'm going to uh, endorse that position as well very, very strongly. There is a, a passage in the discourses where a student of Epictetus apparently asked that very question and said, you know, what, why do I need logic? You know, no, that isn't, isn't it the practice and the ethics enough? And, uh, and Epictetus' response is along the lines of, what well, would you like to argue for that point? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No logic? No, sorry. Then, then it, becomes, it really becomes closer to a faith than, than to a philosophy that you accept because you understand it. And, and you. And in fact, as you were saying earlier, John, you may reasonably disagree. Absolutely. Um, the, the, one of the things that I appreciate about the Stoics is precisely all the evidence that they not only disagreed, of course, predictably with other ancient philosophical schools. And that back and forth was interesting because of course each school refined their own thinking as a result of the challenges that they were getting from the outside but they were getting challenges from the inside as well there were there were one can argue that there were some dominant positions on certain topics but there were certainly alternative positions out there and and it's it's refreshing to see a philosophy that is actually dynamic right from the beginning there's one of my one preferred uh, you know favorite uh, quotes from Seneca I believe is in the one of the letters to Lucilius, where he says that, you know, our predecessors are not our masters, they're our, they're our teachers. Um, and, you know, we don't have to go necessarily where they went. And if we discover new things, it's up to us and the new generations will discover new things. And, and it's, it's a reasonable thing to do to accept uh, new ways of, of uh, seeing uh, things if, in fact, those are, those are actually useful or closer to the truth. Uh, guys, this has been a pleasure. We've been about an hour. Uh, John, thanks so much for, for coming uh, on the show. It is, this was very enjoyable and I think very instructive to a lot of people. We had a peak of, of about 80 people and this is going to be posted soon on YouTube. So there'll be plenty of other people that can benefit from uh, your knowledge of stoicism. Uh, if you are amenable, I will have you again after your book comes out uh, on Marcus Aridus because that, that promises to be another interesting conversation. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Very happy to do it again. Thank you for everyone for your interest. Um, I hope you've found it enjoyable. Thank you and thanks all. Uh, let's uh, just a reminder that the next installation of these uh, occasional series of chats uh, is going to be actually next Monday at four o'clock Eastern time with uh, uh, William Irvine, who is the author of the Stoic Challenge. And we're going to talk about that book as well as other you know, related topics with Bill, who is always an entertaining and interesting uh, author as well. And uh, stay safe, of course. <laughs>